The Curbsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect the official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly Cash Act, Moral Hospital, and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Hey guys, we're back. Hi. <laughs> it gets worse every episode. <laughs> How do you suggest we start the show, Paul? So much less energy. <laughs> Just so bring it down like a lot. No, man, you got to come in hot, Paul. That's what the audience wants. I've pulled them. <laughs> no one is asking for this. <laughs> uh, all right. Tonight on the show, we are talking about sarcopenia. We will define that up front, but essentially we talk about how to uh, how to stay strong how to uh, help your patients who aren't who have lost muscle strength get stronger, and uh, we have two wonderful guests for that. But Paul, before we get into our guest bios, can you tell the audience what what is this show about? What what are we what doing do we do? here? Part I we often ask ourselves at this time of night, Paul, what are we doing with our? <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's about this time where I start questioning life choices. Um, but we are the Internal Medicine Podcast, possibly the strongest internal medicine podcast. And we use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. We spend some time at the beginning of the show getting to know our guests, asking what makes them tick, what drives them, and how they got to be where they are. So if you like being a better person, go ahead and listen. Um, if you want to go ahead and skip past it and lie to me afterwards, that is also an option. Um, but in any case, this is uh, two fantastic guests that we're, are talking about a fascinating topic. Stuart, did you want to introduce our first wonderful guest? I sure do. Our first guest is Dr. I sure do. I sure I'm not do. So sure you do, Stuart. <laughs> I kind of think that you don't. I'm getting the sense you don't want to introduce this guest. <laughs> Jordan Feigenbaum is a primary care physician in California who trained in family medicine until transitioning from clinical practice to focus efforts on barbell medicine. The Thank company you, he started in 2012 during medical school at Eastern Virginia Medical School. Through his experience in clinical medicine, nutrition science, kinesiology, and strength training, he has developed a keen interest in frail patients and the interventions available to combat this. Stuart, why don't you tell us about Dr. Austin Baraki? That's right. So Dr. Austin Baraki is an academic hospitalist in San Antonio, Texas, where he met Jordan in medical school and shares his passion for providing evidence-based uh, guidance on topics such as pain and sarcopenia to both medical professionals and patients alike. Together, with their strengths combined, they have put together numerous extensive researched articles that are available online and published two up-to-date articles with another in the wings on fitness-focused topics. And just so, so you know, I looked at one of their one of their up to date articles had like two hundred and twenty citations. <laughs> yeah. It's yes, ridiculous. I, that qualifies they, as extensively researched. I agree. They also produce the Barbell Medicine podcast, which discusses some of these issues along with many others, and have developed numerous other means to reach out to the community regarding topics in health and fitness. They're also available on YouTube with some very well put together videos. If I don't say so myself. All right, guys. So we can we can get started. Austin and Jordan, thank you for joining us. This has been in the works for like several years, I guess. We were both like <laughs> fledgling podcasters at the same time and talking about doing this. So now it's finally happening. Uh, Austin, we'll go alphabetical order. Why don't you tell the audience a one-liner about yourself and something outside the world of medicine that you're into? And then Jordan, you can you can go next. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, I remember talking with you on the phone probably about 20, 2017, 2016. So uh, it's good. It's good to be here. A yeah. um, little bit about myself. I'm an academic internist in the inpatient setting. I'm a lifter, a coach, kind of a lifelong athlete, uh, husband to a, a military OBGYN. And um, let's see, my uh, my other interest outside of medicine, I enjoy uh, sampling fine whiskeys and uh, as uh, would be suggested by the topic of our podcast, I like lifting weights. Yeah, I, I feel like I wish the audience, Stuart, maybe you should take a snapshot of this so the audience can see the contrast between our guests. It's pretty ridiculous. The size and musculature ridiculous. of our guests and ourselves. Uh, I cannot stop thinking how I am clearly the least dense person here. Like, so, <laughs> when the world is underwater, I'll be the most buoyant. And I just want you guys to remember that. Yes, much better. <laughs> Jordan, uh, what's, can you give us a one-liner? Sure. Uh, 34 year old male, uh, interested, uh, in medical education in obviously lifting weights and outside interests include, uh, motorcycles, 
coffee snobbery and uh, uh, most most recently um, get into photography and videography. So behind the camera most of the time and uh, really enjoy that stuff. I can get on board with some coffee snobbery. That's 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 good stuff. Well, a, a, a jumping social classes is my favorite type of cardio, <laughs> and so like if I can spend ten dollars on a coffee, like I feel good about myself. So <laughs> that's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, you like some avocado it, it, toast with that too. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's actually infused with avocado uh, toast. <laughs> it's like a homeopathic dose. We're <laughs> in, in California. You try to put it in everything. So, yeah. I'm I'm dying to know what uh, what what books do you guys think that we should all read, Austin? Yeah, there's a lot. Both of us do a lot of reading. Um, but when I was thinking ahead towards this question, I was just thinking about um, probably one of the books that has most influenced almost everything about what I do, both in medicine and in my coaching kind of uh, side of things. And uh, uh, one of my areas of interest outside of this uh, specific topic is uh, the world of of pain. Uh, both acute pain, persistent pain, and and how it's just this uh, super globally prevalent problem, really, really difficult to deal with. Uh, and this book is called Explain Pain. Uh, they also have a second version that's more directed towards uh, healthcare professionals, uh, clinicians. It's called Explain Pain Supercharge. It's written by uh, two uh, Australian uh, um, therapists and uh, neuroscientists, researchers, and they've collated basically the past 40, 50 years of pain neuroscience research and uh, put it in, put it together in a really well, well done text that has a lot of uh, kind of applicable takeaways. And it's probably uh, changed more, but more about my practice than anything I learned in medical school or perhaps even residency. So I think all doctors should read it. Yep. That's it. It's got the goofiest cover. That is the book. weirdest cover I've ever seen. That's the one. Stuart, how wow. much is this going to run the audience? And how many uh, copies? Fifty seven sixty seven. It's a it's the weirdest price. It's fifty seven dollars and sixty seven cents. It might yeah. come from Australian dollars and cents being converted oh, that, to US that, dollars. Actually, or something that's like if you that. rent it. Apparently, <laughs> if you buy it new, it's eighty four fifty three. This is a very expensive book. My gosh, this yeah. book sounds awesome. That's a good yeah. recommendation. But they're not running out of stock. Jordan, are you going to give a <laughs> no. book rec as well? Just wait till the show airs. Yes. Yeah. 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 I'll uh I'll do a two for uh one just because I think both these. Books are, are so great. The first one's uh, by David Epstein. It's called Range. Uh, David Epstein's first book was Sports Gene. So if, if you're interested in, in you know any sort of the genetic components of athletic performance, it's a super fascinating read, very heavily annotated, would recommend. But the, his second book, uh, Range, is basically on how humans learn not only – uh, uh, cognitively, but then also physically, and it kind of makes a case for developing this broad base of of sort of physical and mental skills through different uh, sort of uh, processes. So super interesting, just came out. That's a great book. And then the second recommendation, I am in love with this book. It's called A Mind's Eye or The Mind's Eye by uh, Dr. Oliver Sacks. Um, you guys might remember him from The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, which was another great book. But The Mind's Eye is a collection of these really fascinating um, neurology cases. And uh, it wasn't so much about the actual med ed in there, like, oh, you know, this is what happens. Here's the neuroanatomy or whatever. But the actual patient experiences that he shares are really, really well described and in depth. And I thought that was a, a really good read. So those are my two uh, book recommendations. Excellent. So let me. So let's stick with Jordan for now. I'd actually like to hear from both of you, but you but I, I don't want to call it niche because that diminishes it, but you have a, a specific and interesting focus we're going to talk about for the rest of the episode. Is there a particular experience that actually sort of framed this particular focus in medicine for you? Oh, uh, it's a great question. Uh, honestly, so it, it's not one particular experience, although I can kind of speak to that in some ways. Uh, prior to medical school, I actually owned a gym and uh, was in charge of the, I was the educational director for a large uh, coaching company in St. Louis where I'm from. And in any event, I did that for six, seven years before I actually entered medical school. And so coming from that background, when I got into medical school, I was thinking, man, there's all this opportunity for lifestyle you know, change, including uh, exercise, nutritional change, other, other interventions that could benefit patients, both from a preventative standpoint and adjunctive treatment standpoint. So I thought, for sure, we're going to get educated on this in medical school. Like you know, inner standardized patient. <laughs> uh huh. Sure. <laughs> well, we all we all laugh because how'd that go? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, at, at you know, at best, there's lip service was paid to you know exercise interventions and nutritional changes, and, and I think people just say it in passing, similar to how 
many physicians in, in, in practice will actually address this with their patients. You know, at the end of the, the visit, you say, hey, and, you know, you should exercise more and, and eat better. And, and, and here's a pamphlet if you're, if you're lucky. And, and, and I can certainly empathize with the, with the primary care, uh, uh, you know, clinicians because you, you're, you're crunched for time and there's other stuff that you got to talk about. But um, when I, yeah, so going through med- medical school, I was like, okay, nobody's talking about this. And it's not like they know it, but they just are running out of time. There's an actual one of my quality improvement projects during my third year highlighted that physicians don't even know what the current recommendations are for exercise. Less than 10% of all primary care physicians actually know what the current exercise guidelines are. And of those 10% who do know what they are, less than half of them are actually um, recommending them. So it's like, okay, my background is you know firmly in this exercise promotion, um, community health sort of uh, 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 position, how can I bridge this gap? And, and, and then coupled with that, I was in the strength conditioning field for a long period of time, and there's this huge resistance to modern medicine. Like, doctors don't know anything. We're not going to get screened for anything. We're not going to, you know, evaluate our, our, get our health regularly evaluated until something goes catastrophically wrong. And I was like, okay, how do I bring these things together? Because, mo- you know, most coaches, for instance, are going to be dealing with people with chronic diseases, so they need to know about them a- a- as it, it pertains to any contraindications or specific sort of interventions that should be taken from their end while they're in the trenches. And then physicians also need to know about the potential benefits of exercise, uh, specific considerations for that, and nutrition modification to uh, improve their patients' outcomes and overall improve the health of the community. So I was like, I guess I'm just going to do this. Uh, Because, you know, believe it or not, and I think, you know, you took the snapshot, uh, everyone thought that I was going ortho. (laughs) <laughs> right, for like the longest time. But like, you're going ortho, right? And then they would sure. like point. And yeah. I was like, <laughs> and I was like, uh, no, family medicine, actually. You know, I said it like that because uh, I, I remember I was standing in the middle of the emergency room uh, during intern year and uh, somebody's like, oh, are you the ortho resident? I'm like, no, nah, family medicine. They're like, wait, what? It was just, yeah. So uh, in any event, I, I thought going through family medicine and, and trying to bring these two worlds together, that was what I was kind of charged with. And I really – I enjoy it. So if, if there was like a lifestyle medicine sort of specialty I could have gone into, I probably would have picked that. But uh, yeah, uh, based on my pro- previous experience and then just kind of the realization that there was this uh, bridge that needed to be built between the two fields, I felt like who better to do it than me? And uh, yeah, so here we are. That's great. Great. And Austin, how, how did you guys be here? <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to tell the real story? Or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been, I've basically been a lifelong athlete and been very physically active at kind of, uh, it's uh, something I've always done. And then as I kind of uh, proceeded into the medical school, uh, medical training, I ended up starting to observe more and more situations where I was like, hey, this could have been averted. This is something, you know, that we can, we can do better on. And oddly enough, I met Jordan because he was a year behind me in medical school. We, ended, we were at the same institution. And so we kind of, uh, did the predator high five, like, you know, (laughs) uh, as soon as, as soon as we realized kind of where our areas of interest were. And then, uh, uh, obviously he has, he had at the time, he had this kind of larger, greater vision and then kind of wrote me into it. And I said, Hey, I can, I can get on board with this. Um, so that's kind of what's led us to where we are at this point. Well, I think we should start to move on. Stuart, I know you have a quick recommendation that you're dying to give. So I, I I know you're going to give it regardless of whether or not we take time. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, it, it's it's fine. I can give the recommendation where I can wait. It's it's, you know what? I'll just give it. You know, you know, it's fine. <laughs> so, it's the like the status freight train. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a bacteria nomicon. So it is a. I, 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 this has got to be the biggest delight of showing residents. Um, so it, essentially, it's like a. a Dungeons and Dragons type player handbook, but it's it's all the bacteria and antibiotics, and they give them backstories in order to build into their backstory what their potency is. And so, you know, like, uh, you know, doxycycline's nemesis are like rickettsial and babesial species, and I don't know, it's, it's pretty funny. I can see that being very appealing to you, Stuart. That sounds that sounds great. I saw I saw you posting pictures of this on Twitter. It it looks very like it's kind of like fantasy oriented. Yes, very much so. Right. All right, Stuart. Can you start us off with a case from Cashlack? We we got to talk about sarcopenia. 
Yeah, absolutely. So we've got Mr. Lee Richardson. He's a pleasant 66-year-old guy. He's presenting to our clinic for routine follow-up. He's got hypertension as well as uh, well-controlled. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. He, he has hypertension as well-controlled as well as osteoarthritis of the knees. He's well-known to this clinic due to his periodic visits focused on his chronic knee and back pain, but it's the first time that I, that uh, that you're seeing him. Uh, he states that he feels weak and he isn't able to do the things he, he used to do, which is uh, taking a toll on him. He's it's actually quite cachectic. His BMI is 17, and, but does have less ma- muscle mass than would be expected. When asked about exercise, the patient states he, well, he kind of gardens here and there. You press further and he states that after he had a recent MRI, it showed some wear and tear and degenerative discs. He has stayed away from exercise. So review of labs reveals no abnormalities. He is up to date on cancer screening and denies any constitutional symptoms other than feeling weak. You know, it's one of the first things I'm I'm questioning going through all this, considering the topic, what exactly is sarcopenia? How is that defined? Why should we care? I can start, I suppose. Yeah. So sarco- sarcopenia is a term that refers to a, a decrease in muscle mass. Uh, the roots of the word refer to uh, kind of come from Greek, I believe, uh, describing a poverty of flesh. So historically, the emphasis has been on the amount of muscle mass that an individual carries. Um, since then, uh, and, and in recent years, research in this area has exploded pretty dramatically. There have been multiple uh, international working groups assembled on this topic, probably most notably the European Working Group on Sarcopenia in Older People. That's kind of what they call themselves. They met 10 years ago and again this past year. And they've kind of started to shift the emphasis in terms of the definition of sarcopenia uh, more towards muscle strength rather than absolute amount uh, amounts of muscle mass. They actually now consider it a muscle-specific disease state, um, kind of like a, if we were to call somebody, uh, we're, we're to describe somebody as having like chronic heart failure. Uh, this would be an example where somebody has chronic skeletal muscle failure is kind of the idea here, uh, where, again, more recently, the emphasis is shifting towards muscle strength, uh, overtaking the significance of uh, absolute amounts of muscle mass. Yeah, and it should be noted, so like Austin said, that uh, the root of the word is Greek, uh, poverty of flesh, sarks meaning flesh, penia loss, so your loss of flesh. But a lot of people will use the terms like sarcopenia and cachexia like interchangeably, and and that's not terribly accurate. So in fact, most cachectic patients are sarcopenic, but sarcopenic patients may not have cachexia. And, and similarly, another synonym that people will also often use is frailty for this sort of thing. But frailty is more of a syndrome um, of like age-related cumulative declines and multiple physiologic symptoms, not just this sort of quote unquote muscle, skeletal muscle sort of failure. Um, and, and also inc- include sort of the psychological and social dimensions of, of uh, the person's state as well. So just it, we need to be clear about the definitions and not use the terms interchangeably. Although when reading the research, you may find that particularly in older papers before these uh, international working groups have, have kind of, you know, put out, put out the definitions that we're using now. So I, I guess the question I have I always struggle a little bit with that sort of about the medicalization of sort of normal aging. So you mentioned the sarcopenia is a disease state and, you know, you lose muscle mass as you get older. What differentiates it? What's what makes it pathological as opposed to just being kind of one of those things that you just earn by living long enough? Yeah. Yeah. So we do have a lot of, uh, I suppose you could consider it normative data across the lifespan in terms of what strength looks like. So primarily, this there there are pretty large cohorts, multiple you know tens of thousands of individuals where they'll do hand grip testing on them across the lifespan, for example. And you'll see that, for example, hand grip strength, which is a pretty well validated measure uh, of strength in people, um, it tends to increase up to around age 20 or 30 or so, and then it starts to decline a little bit between 30 and 50, and then after 50 or so, it de- uh, the the decline accelerates even further. And so, on average, you might find that that somebody between age of 20 and 80, for example, they might lose upwards of 50% of their skeletal muscle mass. And so, whereas you might say, yeah, we have normative data saying that this happens to most people. Well, we also have pretty abundant amounts of data across multiple different disease states um, uh, uh, reflecting, for example, increased rates of mortality in association with things like cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, liver disease, lung disease, cancer, autoimmune conditions, where individuals who have those conditions and are sarcopenic do worse than those who are not. And this is obviously a complex interplay. There's probably some causative factors there. There's probably also some correlational factors there, and it's kind of difficult to tease those apart. Um, and and we also have evidence that's kind of more the chronic uh, type of sarcopenia that you're talking about over the course of the lifespan. Traditionally, it was described as being an age-related condition. 
But we also know that sarcopenia can happen really at any age. I, I know that, you know, for, for me in the inpatient medicine, I see plenty of people who in the who are in the younger ages who I might admit who I might consider to be sarcopenic um, or, 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 you know, might be profoundly weak out of proportion to what I would expect for a healthy age matched control in their situation, even who might have the same medical condition. And you can also have uh, acute sarcopenia as well. You might have a, a, a dramatic, rapid loss of muscle mass, uh, for example, in the setting of critical illness. We have data uh, from uh, hospitalized inpatients in the setting of critical illness where uh, uh, you may, depending on the, it's stratified even by the number of organ systems that have failed. So you might lose upwards of 30 to 40% of your skeletal muscle mass in the course of the first seven to 10 days of a hospitalization if you have multi-system organ failure. Um, and so all these things we have, you know, we have this observed normative data over the lifespan, but we also have lots and lots of prospective data indicating higher rates of mortality, morbidity, and decreased quality of life, uh, 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 as well as increased hospitalization, increased healthcare costs, all kinds of things associated with sarcopenic individuals compared to non-sarcopenic individuals. Yeah. So it sounds like what you're saying is that there's an inflection point where you, you've effectively lost so much muscle strength and function that it's negatively affecting, the, you know, the court, the trajectory of a, of a patient's life. And at that point, we call it sarcopenia rather than just age age related loss of, of muscular function. Yeah. And, and because of that, establishing clear cutoffs for this stuff is pretty difficult. And that obviously influences if we're going to quote data on prevalence and things like that. It becomes difficult when we want to say you, you're supposed to have this much muscle mass at this time. The cutoffs are still kind of in flux in the research world. And, and that, that kind of gives, gives us a good springboard for this patient. So is there anything specifically about this patient that would increase your, your suspicion for sarcopenia? And if so, what? Well, you said that he was 66 years old. So automatically being over the age of 65 kind of does put you into this, you know, there's a greater prevalence, like once you hit that 65 year old cutoff, just, but that's where a lot of the data like has been you know, collated as well. So, you know, is, is there a huge difference going from age 64 to 65? You know, hard hard to say, but a lot of the data that's been collected suggests that you know, if you want, over the age of sixty five, up to you know twenty five percent of the population is going to have going to have uh, sarcopenia based on the current uh, diagnostic criteria. Um, the low BMI, I think you said he's, his BMI was seventeen. 17. Yeah, yeah. So while that's not a diagnostic criteria or a validated screening uh, sort of tool, um, just that off the bat, being underweight is very well correlated uh, with low muscle mass. And then finally, the the subjective complaint of uh, muscle weakness and, and, and decreased strength to, to perform the activities of daily life all would be sort of, w would be the sort of a clinical sort of judgment of like, mm, I'm, I'm worried that this patient has sarcopenia. And then at that point you would move to sort of screening, um, and, and, and go from there. But, but nothing uh, like that was reported definitively says, yep, this patient's got it based on the diagnostic criteria we currently have. I do want to, I, I do want to get into talking about specifically how we would make the diagnosis. Cause I want to give the audience as many practical tips as we possibly can. Uh, so Austin, I'll throw the question to you. You mentioned grip strength at the bedside. What else other than grip strength are, and, and how are you measuring grip strength? And then what else might we use as like someone in a primary care office to, to kind of diagnose this? Yeah. Yeah. This is a good question. Cause obviously, I mean, I empathize with the, the, uh, uh, problems that can come up with trying to integrate something like this, some, some, some new piece of information into your regular clinical practice workflow. And everybody that comes on your podcast is talking about their niche area. And here's the thing that you need to add to your practice. And it's going to become <laughs> pretty impractical after a certain amount of time. Yeah. And so I've, I've dealt with the same thing. And so I've tried to figure out how can I uh, uh, kind of incorporate this into my daily practice patterns. And so going to the European Working Group on Sarcopenia and Older People, they actually lay out a proposal for a kind of a diagnostic algorithm. Um, if somebody wants to go to the literature, to the evidence base, to actually see how it's been proposed there. I will say, however, that I'm personally not a huge fan of that for its applicability to clinical practice, because again, I think that the uptake is going to be relatively low. I don't think that a huge swath of your audience is going to go out and buy hand grip dynamometers and start doing this on their patients, you know, who come to clinic every day or who are in the hospital, even though that's the best kind of validated uh, data set that we have. What I do like, however, rather than a direct measure of uh, muscle strength is a measure of physical performance, because that's one of the three kind of prongs to sarcopenia is low muscle strength, low muscle uh, quantity, and then low physical performance. I actually would prefer because I think it's probably the most patient centered thing to do. And it's also one of the easiest things to measure uh, is going to be a, a, a physical performance metric. There are several of these that have been looked at in the literature. There are things called a short physical performance battery. There's like a six minute walk. There's all kinds of stuff. But again, I'm like, who's doing six minute walk? 
box in their clinic on these patients and measuring the stuff. So of the things that have been studied, the ones that I've found that are probably the easiest, the quickest to do, the ones that I use, uh, one is a repeat chair sit to stand. Uh, basically, you have the patient cross their arms and you have them stand up and sit down out of the chair as quickly as they can five times. And if that takes longer than 15 seconds, then that's considered a positive screen. Of course, Many of the patients that I am seeing in the inpatient setting, Stuart's going to test himself with that right now. I, I was, I was <laughs> just thinking in my head. I'm like, yeah. I know Stuart's going to start doing these. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, I know that you all and most primary care clinicians routinely see patients who might be a- unable to do this even once without using their arms. And in my mind, I consider that a positive screen automatically. Um, and and obviously, uh, patients can be even weaker and be unable to do it regardless, you know, uh, at all, which would obviously be a positive screen. So that's that's one example. Um, Another one that's pretty well uh, uh, commonly known and is trained in in most residencies is just a timed up and go test. That's a reasonable test of physical performance. That's one that people feel pretty comfortable doing. Takes, you know, 20 seconds to accomplish. And then, and then the last one that I, that I like is gate speed. And technically the cutoff that's used for gate speed is uh, 0.8 meters per second. And so that would be that if you're walking uh, about, I forget if it's like four or five meters and you can do that in five seconds, something like that, then, uh, and, and that's something, for example, I suppose you could, I could envision a scenario where somebody has like five meters taped off on the floor in their primary care clinic. And as the patient's walking back to the room, you can, you can time them or something if you wanted to integrate it into your workflow. So it didn't add more to the time. And, and I would view these sorts of physical performance things um, as something, obviously everybody wants what the, their niche is to be a vital sign, but I mean, their physical performance uh, has such huge implications for their uh, f- uh, for their quality of life and risk of admission and and uh, ultimate health outcomes that I think that you know, these things are you know again taking under twenty to thirty seconds to accomplish and can give you some valuable information. Yeah, be yep. careful about giving TJC the twenty third vital sign. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> the unintended yeah. consequences are poten- are, are uh, possible for sure. The other other things that you you may have diagnostically already, depending on the patient population and what sort of tests that you do normally, would be something like if they if a patient's undergone a DEXA scan uh, recently. Um, so, for instance, if it's over sixty five uh, year old female who's had a DEXA scan, um, you can basically get their skeletal muscle in, mass index, which is and there's cutoffs for uh, men and women. So, if a man had a DEXA scan for whatever reason, you could have that data and compare that to the cutoffs. Um, there's, it's published by that European Working Group uh, Society, so they, they have those. Um, and in addition, it might have a bioelectrical impedance sort of test if you're measuring body fat in the clinic. Now, most primary care uh, you know, uh, docs aren't, aren't doing that, but, but some are. And uh, so there are, again, cutoffs for uh, the bioelectrical impedance sort of uh, calculated skeletal muscle mass index. Those are uh, sort of objective stuff. Uh, one thing that uh, you see crop up in the literature over and over again is people measuring calf circumferences. Uh, that was uh, one of the original, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's called the Timmy test. And that was originally one of the original like screening, yeah, screening to our, di- yeah, our diagnostic tools used. And so it was like this calf circumference of less than 31 centimeters was like the cutoff. However, it's prone to errors, particularly in, in older individuals because uh, the way they end up storing body fat and losing muscle mass is not quite sensitive. And, or And fluid. <laughs> yes, correct. Yes, sure. yeah. yes, exactly. Yes. Yes, you're, you're a patient with edema. You're like, wow, your calf's huge. You're probably fine. That's probably <laughs> <laughs> false, false negative. Um, but I, I agree with Austin. The you know trying to get some of that physical performance battery is probably the the best thing that you can do because it really encompasses many of those uh, sort of prongs, as as he said, in, in, for for sarcopenias. That's probably the the best to do. It seems like these these functional assessments be hugely useful um, and obviously patient centric. But is there any kind of blood work or any lab tests that you would order if you suspect underlying sarcopenia? Yeah. So so based on the current like diagnostic criteria, there's none that have like either established cutoffs uh, or have been validated in in these large trials. Um, so again, they, they're, they're saying the European Working Group, for instance, suggests measure. You know, you could get a DEXA scan, you could get a bioelectrical impedance, you can do these these performance batteries, but no um, like sort of lab lab tests that you would you would otherwise see. Um, there is a questionnaire. It's called the SARC F questionnaire. That's uh, basically four questions about physical performance. Like, hey, can you lift and carry ten pounds comfortably? Can you get up and out of a chair or transfer to the bed, you know, uh, uh, without any assistance? All sorts of things like that. But no, like objective lab data. Although interestingly, in the hospitalized population, there are established cutoffs for creatinine values and how that uh, portends a worse outcome due to low muscle mass. And the the value I know for men is 0.4. I don't know what the the value offhand for 
for women is, but it's like if, if you've got a guy who comes in with a creatinine value of less than 0.4, you're like, mm, I think your muscle mass is probably uh, under what it should be. And, and that correlates just as an aside. Uh, basically, when you're when you're doing these DEXA scans or, or biological impedance, what you're trying to f- figure out uh, by there, then calculating the skeletal muscle mass index is, does this person have muscle mass that's greater than two standard deviations less than, than the norm. And so, um, you know, your guy with a really low creatinine, uh, which basically we can use as a proxy uh, in somebody with normal kidney function for skeletal muscle mass amounts, uh, you're like, wow, this person is uh, uh, pretty low on the old uh, skeletal muscle mass. I think Austin has a story when we do these these lect- uh, seminars, he talks about a patient that he saw who actually had a serum creatinine of zero, uh, yeah. it's effect- <laughs> yeah. which... Which you don't need. Spinal muscular atrophy will will do that in its end stages. So that's what that's what was going on there. Yeah, Yeah. I think Austin, I I saw one of your powerpoints I reviewed before. uh, You know this interview. There was like it. It almost looked like it's a U shape or J shape. Like basically very low creatinine, very high creatinine. There's I think it was mortality actually. They were looking at. Yeah, that data set was from about 50,000 individuals, I think, and it was actually looking at in, in hospital mortality. So it was like during that hospitalization, if you're admission creatinine, obviously it was high, obviously you got problems going on. But I think for men, as it dropped below 0.7, which was higher than you might think, at like 0.6 mm. to 0.5, 0.4, like the, the risk went up with each with each uh, uh, tenth of a uh, point drop there. And for women, it was uh, 0.4, 0.3, you know, below, below that cutoff, mortality went up as well. So there's risks to having those super low creatinine means, which is something that, you know, when I'm hearing these, uh, these labs presented on rounds, uh, those kind of catch my ear. Uh, uh, and, and I end up using it as kind of a teaching point for, for students and residents as well. Hmm. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that, just because you, you do primarily inpatient care. Yes, yes. That's your focus. Yeah, I was going to ask you how you incorporate assessment for sarcopenia and just I, and we'll get to sort of interventions later on. But what I, I yeah, I sure. feel like most of this is gonna be sort of an outpatient focus. I'm just curious as to how you use it on the inpatient side and, and what what kind of diagnostic stuff and you you incorporate into your into your workflow. Yeah, yeah. So um, I definitely do incorporate it in the inpatient side, and and it's obviously most of the patients that I'm seeing in that set, in that setting um, generally just fail the eyeball test as it pertains to sarcopenia, <laughs> yeah. because I know that they can't sit up by themselves in bed or can't you know uh, uh, hold their torso up in a chair or something like that. But I still oftentimes will do something of a screening in the sense that I'll ask them. My test of choice is the repeat sit to stands, and of course I'll have some patients who are able to do the repeat sit to stands are able to do it fine. I'll have some who would do it, but they struggle. It's a bit slow, and some who maybe can do it once, and then they need to use their arms the rest of the time, or who can't do it at all. And basically, what I do is I kind of use that to uh, to kind of point out to the patient that hey, you have a strength deficit here, a physical function deficit. And then I kind of spin it into like a little mini motivational interviewing session. And I say, Hey, what do you, you know, what kind of things do you wish you'd be able to do at home? What kind of things would you like to be able to do that you can't do right now? And oftentimes they're able to say, you know, I used to be able to do this. This was my favorite thing. I can't do it anymore. Well, what do you think you could do to get back to that kind of, that kind of thing? And maybe they might not know. And if they don't know, then I might have a suggestion. And my first line intervention of choice for that patient right there is the very test that I just showed them. I'd like you to do this. The test that I just gave you is the exercise. It's the, effectively performing a body weight squat to a chair. If you can get to the point where you can increase how many repetitions of that you can do with or without your arms, say you can do two now, if you get to the point where you can do six, that's going to be a market improvement in your physical function. If you get to the point where you can do it without your arms, that's an even bigger improvement in your physical function. And so that's how I kind of weave it together in the inpatient setting, uh, particularly when patients are, are, are you know, it, it's very, very, very clear to them uh, when they're getting weaker or they're losing physical function or every time they come into the hospital, they end up going home worse or they have to go to rehab. And so I try to like spin all these things together with their life and their goals and things like that into like a little mini five minute motivational interviewing intervention. And, uh, and that's how I kind of do it. And I try to teach the residents to do the same. Right. It, 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 it seems like those chronic conditions that would decrease someone's motivation to move. So things like chronic pain and obesity would have an association with uh, sarcopenia. Is this what we see in the literature? Yeah. Yeah. Overwhelmingly. So, and in fact, any, any, any disease state, uh, particularly like inflammatory diseases, um, will not only be caught, uh, can, can be a sort of causative element for sarcopenia via increasing what's known as anabolic resistance, which effectively means the patient 
uh, has a subnormal response to anabolic stimuli, either dietary or exercise related. So effectively, they build less muscle mass from any from like dietary protein. They build less muscle mass and strength from uh, from training. Um, and so a lot of these chronic conditions actually cause anabolic resistance in addition to promoting sedentary behavioral patterns, which also is associated with with uh, increased uh, uh, incidence of, of sarcopenia. So yeah, you see these comorbidities and and, and Probably that makes is one of the reasons why sarcopenia can be so hard to manage once it's already present, you know, and particularly if it's very severe. So when people have, you know, very severe sarcopenia, or if you look at the European work group uh, societies, you know, uh, sort of uh, definitions of this, they call it like a secondary sarcopenia, either due to activity, it's either activity related or disease related sarcopenia. Uh, it's really hard to treat because the conditions that they have in addition to the actual sarcopenia diagnosis, like prevent the management strategies from working very, very well. Um, so it, it's tough. And so we kind of view sarcopenia, like what is our like what is our role in the medical community with respect to sarcopenia is prevention is the is the primary sort of sort of goal here. And you know, at, while providing information towards like here's what you can do once you already have it. But yeah, the the conditions that you mentioned um, can definitely make this uh, tricky to to treat in addition to being causative. This sounds sounds like very you're... doom and gloom right now. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the negative part of the podcast. We're, we'll get a climax here later on, but we've, inter- we've introduced tension now. So. Yeah, would, no, this is, this is act would, two. It's fine. That's how these things are would, supposed to go. I would point out, you mentioned the, the aspect of obesity, and, and um, that is just an important aside because we differentiated earlier between sarcopenia and cachexia, and cachexia is like this complex metabolic syndrome. It's usually driven by inflammation. You tend to get lean mass and fat mass wasting, but you can actually have situations where an individual is sarcopenic. They have inadequate muscle mass, but they're also obese at the same time. We call that sarcopenic obesity. And in addition, uh, muscle mass tends to track with bone mass pretty closely. So uh, uh, you can also have osteopenia or osteoporosis in association with this, and then you lead to the even more ridiculous uh, diagnostic term you'll see in the literature of osteosarcopenic obesity, where they have all of, oh, this, nice. all of these things stuff. going in the wrong direction. And, and then with obesity, these... hypovenatory symptoms <laughs> on top of that. Yes. Yep. So each of these ends up getting worse and worse outcomes. So yes, prevention is definitely ideal. <laughs> This, this, I, I'm great. I want to go back to this point because we talked that a lot of providers, uh, oh, not supposed to use that word, forgive me, a lot of physicians or practitioners, whatever it is we're calling them, um, are not familiar with the current recommendations regarding physical activity. And of course, I, as an award winning educator and a spectacular <laughs> primary care doctor, <laughs> know those recommendations, but I don't want to co opt. I mean, this is your time to shine, guys. So if you, you could just you sort have of remind them tattooed us. tattooed on your arm, Paul. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> it's you a just, very small yeah. tattoo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so if you guys could just remind us what the uh, let's let me flip it to Jordan, I guess, what the current recommendations are about physical activity um, sure. that we should be counseling our patients for for prevention. Yep. So these are uh, guidelines originally came out in 2008, the 2008 physical activity guidelines for adults. Um, and the initial recommendation was that uh, all adults should engage in twice weekly resistance training and in addition achieve uh, 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity vigorous or moderate intensity aerobic training. Uh, or 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous intensity aerobic training. And they, the differentiation there between the two is based on metabolic equivalents, metabolic equivalent just being a proxy for energy use. Um, so right now we're all here just yapping our, you know, yapping our jaws. And uh, it's we're expending about one metabolic equivalent. And then the cutoff for uh, moderate intensity uh, activity is uh, four to six METs. And then above six METs is considered vigorous intensity uh, aerobic activity. And so one, one, uh, those are the recommendations that came out in 2008. Uh, and 2018, they were updated. Uh, basically, they, they provided more um, scientific uh, literature supporting like, what these interventions actually have the potential to do, but the recommendations have stayed the same. So they've really been in practice in play for, for, you know, over a decade now. Um, and you can find those, they're freely available. Uh, the 2018 physical activity guidelines for Americans is, I just remember it as, uh, twice weekly resistance training and then, uh, 500 to a thousand met minutes of activity, which basically is breaks down to any type of either moderate intensity or vigorous intensity, uh, aerobic training, um, that people should be engaged in. And they can achieve that in five minute bouts if they want. So if a person wants to just go for a brisk walk at five minutes at a time, that's cool. Um, 
in, in another way to kind of communicate this because people are if you say the word metabolic equivalent like automatically eyes glaze over and they're like uh what doc uh easy way to do uh that has been validated is called a respiratory rate or uh, this respiratory sort of uh rpe which means rate of perceived exertion um, so if you can talk in complete sentences uh, but not uh, but not sing, that qualifies as moderate intensity aerobic training. And then if you can barely speak in short sentences, so a little bit more breathlessness, that qualifies as vigorous intensity aerobic training. So when communicating this to patients or lay, the lay public, I'm like, hey, you need to lift weights twice a week for 60 minutes at a time. And in addition, you need to do aerobic training, ideally every day um, in you know five-minute bouts, and try to get a total of at least 150 minutes per week. So that that breaks down to about 20 minutes a day of activity where you can't really talk in complete sentences and you certainly can't sing. And they go, oh, okay, that that's more understandable, you know. And if you if you say brisk walking, that's fine. But it can really be any activity that they they want to do. Um, most people then ask, well, how many steps should I take per day, doc? Right? How many steps? Because that's been advertised. Uh, unfortunately, that data is not very good. Like the 10,000 steps per day thing is not based in evidence. That's based in marketing. Um, the only data we have on steps are that uh, if you uh, achieve over 4,000 steps per day, that seems to be associated with lower risk of all-cause mortality and uh, ASCVD. Uh, but then actually that's like the minimum threshold. And then if you increase that to 7,500 steps per day, you get a further reduction in a ASCVD. So if you had to come up with like a step recommendation and people have that on their, their smartphones, um, you could make an evidence-based recommendation for 7,500 steps per day, but I would stick with the physical activity guidelines for Americans, which, uh, again, is that 150 to 300 minutes and that's minimum. So our, 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 our goal is to get people to, ex to exceed these things, right? Like, can is it okay if I resistance train three times per week, Doc? Uh, it sure is. Is it okay if I exercise, you know, more than that, those 300 minutes? It sure is. And and, and the rationale for that is we see over and over again in the literature, well, you know, uh, it's been well described that there's this dose-dependent relationship between exercise volume and these outcomes like muscular strength, muscle mass, decrease in uh, or increase in cardiorespiratory fitness, inc improved quality of life. And so that's just a fancy exercise science way of saying the more exercise that somebody does, the better off they're going to be. So trying to initiate that behavioral change and really promoting that lifestyle seems to be pretty important. So I just want to punt this one to Austin. So how do you how do you alter those recommendations for someone who's who say has a COPD who's breathless at baseline? Yeah. Yeah. So there's definitely some specific uh, research into uh, uh, individuals who have these various uh, medical comorbidities that we see on a regular basis, and um, there are a few interesting findings in some of this some of this literature. For example, the the COPD patients, getting them to actually resistance train may be more feasible than it might be to get them to do a whole bunch of aerobic activity because of where the limiting factors end up being. And individuals with COPD have numerous risk factors for sarcopenia. Obviously, we've seen end-stage COPD patients who are, you know, skin and bones, um, and they end up on hospice for that very reason. And so, you know, it may be a situation where you're not necessarily getting them to meet or exceed these physical activity recommendations may not be feasible, at least at the start for these individuals, in which case you kind of have to make a triage what's most important for this individual's daily life and a physical function. And, you know, obviously our bias would be to actually get them resistance training uh, uh, so that, be, I mean, interestingly, in the individual COPD, their quadriceps strength is actually a better predictor of mortality than FEV1 is. We have some data to, to, to s support that. And so I would, my bias for them would be to get them re to resistance train. If I could get them to strength train twice a week, I would be thrilled with that. And I would expect that as their physical capacity improves from the strength standpoint, they may be able to tolerate greater amounts of conditioning, uh, along with their adjunctive kind of COPD therapies to keep their uh, disease st uh, state under control. Well, there's similarly a recent uh, recent paper on uh, individuals with fatty liver disease, for example, and, and uh, there's, there's kind of similar recommendations on that. We've gone through multiple different comorbidities, actually. I think we may cite or plug the, the up-to-date articles that we wrote on this on this topic going through disease state by disease state, showing what the evidence uh, uh, supports in terms of resistance training guidelines for these individuals. So I, I want to make sure that we get into like specific recommendations uh, beyond what we've done so far. So let's say we go back to our six year six year old patient. He's got this MRI that says he's got wear and tear. He doesn't want to exercise. 
uh, Jordan, how do you talk someone through that? And like, and, and we've already kind of hinted around this. We're t- we're internists. We take care of like really sick people in their seventies, their eighties. They have bad heart failure, COPD, CKD. They're on dialysis. Like these patients, uh, it's not normal to recommend resistance training. Some of these patients may have never done in their lives. How can we possibly get them to resistance train? Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, I think a lot of this uh, comes back to uh, like behavioral change and, and and you know getting people to change you know uh, uh, ultimately change their their daily habits. So motivational interviewing is super important here. Um, and one question in, initially that I would start out with is, hey, what sort of exercise are you willing to do? Or are you interested in doing? And and ideally trying to get a person to vo- verbalize it themselves, like, hey, I'd actually be interested in doing this, or you know, I actually would be interested in doing anything. What do you recommend? And then then you can start of sort of guide the person. Um, somebody who's very resistant to uh, engaging in exercise, y- you want to elicit the concerns. So this patient, uh, due to their history of pain, may be like, hey, I have this knee pain and this low back pain. And, you know, look, the MRI even said wear and tear, <laughs> which uh, yeah. Austin is is very triggered over there because. <laughs> uh, Isn't he going to wear, not, he's going to create worse wear and tear. I mean, obviously that's what's going to happen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not, not the preferred norm, nomenclature and certainly not the right narrative that you want to build with your patients. So uh, 10 out of 10 would recommend leaving that off the MRI report. <laughs> uh, um, but but one way to to try to get around that, and you know, I'm not pre- going to pretend that you can do this all in one visit, and this is just easy. It works 100% of the time. But um, one thing we like to use is called this expectation violation. So you know, if the person's concerned about knee pain or low back pain, it's like, hey, have you ever, uh, for instance, gardened? If the patient likes gardening or whatever, and not had knee pain, and they go, oh yeah, actually, this you know, I did last week, and so it's like, okay, well, d- that makes sense that you might be able to actually move your lower extremities uh, in a sort of vigorous fashion without getting pain. And they go, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, maybe you're right. Same thing with low back pain. Yeah, uh, have you ever bent over and picked something up and not had low back pain? And they go, yeah. And it's like, okay, well, what we want to do is train that, uh, you know, in a progressively overloaded fashion. You know, you might use different uh, uh, verbiage there, so you, you know, don't their eyes don't glaze over. But uh, from a practical perspective, after your handling concerns and you get somebody to kind of buy into this, I think the most practical recommendation would be to refer. And it's going to be important to not just refer for like therapeutic exercise with a physical therapist, not to say that there aren't great physical therapists out there, but one, that's a barrier for people. They may not have access uh, to that with their healthcare plans, but it would be nice to have a, um, an alliance with a, an exercise professional in the community um, where you could actually refer to and to be fair, like when we do these seminars and, and, you know, I'm definitely trying to straddle this fence between the exercise and coaching community and medical community, the exercise community is like, Hey, how do I get doctors to refer patients to me so that I can, you know, give them this therapeutic exercise. And I'm like, well, maybe it's, maybe what we should do instead of trying to get you to like solicit these doctors is uh, try to get the doctors to start, you know, soliciting you guys. So I would try to uh, form an alliance if I was a, a primary care physician in the community with a local gym um, and some local coaches and trainers and and try to uh, refer there. The immediate concern and pushback you get from medical professionals is like, well, isn't this dangerous, right? There's an injury risk. Um, and so actually the injury risk from resistance training is extremely low, uh, about one to two uh, injuries per thousand participation hours, which is exceedingly low compared to the risks of being sedentary or not engaging in the physical activity. And and, and for, you go further, there's actually a non-zero risk of engaging in like walking. Like walking has injury rates as high as 1.2 injuries per thousand participation hours. And so, you know, so some physicians, particularly the uh, uh, the outgoing class, uh, might say, "Yeah, you just walk more." And um, unfortunately, that appears to be underdosed uh, uh, an underdosed uh, recommendation for physical activity. And that's probably one of the the bigger things we see too is when physicians kind of uh, recommend exercise. They just say, "Well, just walk more." And uh, if you really want to make a dent in somebody's uh, in somebody's sarcopenia, or you really want to prevent this, it can't just be walking. Um, the, the the that's just an underdose recommendation, and and it further not evidence based based on the 2018 physical activity guidelines. So handling concerns in the clinic, expectation violation, refer appropriately, and then uh, really try to get uh, the patient to verbalize like, hey, I want to I want to do this. I'm ready to take charge of my medical condition. And, and uh, those would be steps I think uh, are, uh, that you can practically apply in the clinic. 
the way I the way I typically frame this uh, when describing it is, you know, we have other conditions where we try to elicit some behavior change, and and it's been burned into all of our brains that if somebody smokes, we talk to them about quitting smoking every time we see them, right? And even though we know that it's not going to work for every single person, um, we have guidelines on what medications we should prescribe for primary prevention, for example. We know in the back of our minds it's not saving all of them from having, uh, you know, negative outcomes from these things, but we do it anyway, based on NNT values that are favorable for certain interventions and and the idea that i have about this is kind of the clinic every clinician every doctor who's seeing a patient they have their own kind of exercise counseling nnt in other words how many patients do they have to counsel before they can get one to change their mind and actually do this or to actually engage in the behavior and that uh, that is dependent on the individual physician's skill set. So the more skilled they are with this, uh, the more re- access to resources they have that they can plug their their patient into the community, and kind of the better they are at building this rapport, this relationship, and motivational interviewing, the lower your individual exercise NNT is going to be, where maybe a really, really skilled person might interview 20 people and get one to actually engage in training. Hey, that's a better statistic than a lot of other interventions that we do all the time in practice. Austin, have you... Uh giving these recommendations, uh, like let's say you just moved to a community, you reach out to a gym, do you have to give guidance to the the physical trainer that's going to be working with a patient? And then of course there's some going to be some cost concerns, but let's just say we find somebody, but can you, can you kind of guide us through that? In terms of, would you, yeah, like, would you, do do we have to give any guidance to the person, you know, to the physical trainer? Like, okay, this person has COPD, so they, it, you know, they're going to get short of breath easily, but I want you to work on these kind of exercises with them, like functional movements. How do you know, like, what you're getting or how do you screen the, the physical trainer, I guess? Yeah, that's tough. I think it definitely involves a conversation with the person and trying to get a sense of what their kind of coaching practice pattern is, so to speak, and what kind of things they focus on and maybe getting a sense of their experience and what kind of people they work with. So if somebody says, yeah, all I've ever coached are like, you know, 18 to 20 year old males who are college students, it's like, eh, maybe we need to find somebody with a little broader experience base. Yeah. Some some healthcare systems have, you know, access to physical therapists who can kind of introduce this process. But unfortunately, as Jordan was mentioning, that a lot of the exercise interventions that are actually put into practice from from the medical side of things uh, tend to be underdosed. And in yeah. fact, if you go to the Choosing Wisely guidelines from the American Physical Therapy Association, uh, one of their specific uh, Choosing Wisely guidelines is don't prescribe underdosed resistance training programs <laughs> to older adults. I've literally because- had sarcopenic patients complain to me that the the their and this is again not a knock on the physical therapist but it's just like i think the bar is so low for what yes. qualifies as training they'll be like well yeah. the person just comes to my house and they tell me to kick my legs forward and like i feel like i get <laughs> yes. you know i feel like yes. i need stronger yeah. training than that and this is like yes. the yeah. the 80 year old patient with heart failure that's like i can do <laughs> i can do more than what they're challenging me so i i, I appreciate yeah, the it's, point it's it's, it's almost like they, problem. it's almost like they they need like a human performance uh, consultation, not just physical therapy. I know that one one issue is that they're very afraid of. Everybody's just very risk averse, and I've you know t- uh, talked to physical therapists who are afraid of upsetting the doctor by doing too much with their patient or oh, something geez. like that. Particularly in the acute setting, I've I've talked to them and they have that. So sometimes, I mean, even, maybe even easier than trying to have this detailed conversation with a coach in the community is maybe if you have a physical therapist who you trust, having a conversation with them and saying, hey, it's okay to push this person and to do more than you know. Uh, uh, resistance bands for two sets of 10 and sending them home or doing some kind of passive intervention or something like that. Right. You can push this patient hard. You have the go ahead on that. Yeah. Yep. I, I mean, I feel like this plan would be much easier to implement in your 40 to 65 year old person who doesn't yet have sarcopenia, but you, you can see them heading there. Like, I think this will work really well. It's going to be easy for them to, you know, they're in their head. They probably still can be physically training. I think for the 65 plus crowd, it's going to take a special person and, and just a little more legwork for it to initially be set up. But it sounds like it's worth <laughs> no the, pun intended. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. it sounds also, like it, it sounds like it's worth the the um, the effort to get that set up. I definitely think it is. And I also think more than more so than just, you know, on a one to individual basis, you know, obviously our uh, hope being here is to reach a broader set of clinicians to educate them on it. And so if we can get to a point where that individual is getting this message consistently, you know, whether it's at every primary care visit or even at every primary care visit and every specialist visit they go to, their nephrologist is telling them to exercise, their cardiologist is telling them to train, their, you know, pulmonologist is telling them they need a resistance train to get the more consistently this message can be delivered. It almost needs a whole social cultural shift to, to be yeah. effective. So it's a big undertaking, obviously. <laughs> 
So we, we talked a lot about physical activity, which obviously is sort of the, the cornerstone of management for, for our sarcopenic patients. But are there other other treatments available? What kind of diet counseling should we be doing? There's, I mean, a, about a bazillion supplements that sometimes my patients even ask me about. So how, how should we be counseling about those things? Sure. This is a great question. Um, if I had to make one recommendation, it would be for increasing dietary protein intake. And this is evidence-based uh, based on the ESPN 2014 uh, guidelines for uh, protein intake and healthy aging. Um, so effectively, the current uh, RDA is 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram body weight per day. That's the recommendation for all adults. Um, with that in mind, though, older adults actually tend to eat less protein and and to compound that that problem, uh, they also tend to be more anabolically resistant. And uh, I won't belabor this anabolic resistance point, but other but to say again, this is a subnormal response to anabolic stimuli, dietary and from training. And this is due to lack of blood flow, uh, principally, me- meaning that the gut takes up um, amino acids from dietary protein less readily, and the increase in uh, blood levels of amino acids is less robust compared to a younger or less anabolically resistant uh, person. And then, and, sec- and then finally, there's less transfer of these uh, amino acids to the actual skeletal muscle. So at three different levels, you're getting sort of resistance to this anabolic stimulus from dietary protein. So with that in mind, the these 2014 guidelines suggest that uh, older adults should be taken in between 1.2 and 2.0 grams of protein per kilogram body weight per day, which is, you know, realistically double what the RDA is. And uh, with respect to actually resistance training, you know, because you might get a younger patient who doesn't have sarcopenia who's like, hey, doc, how much protein do I actually need per day to maximize my gains in the gym? And you're like, I mean, shrug. Uh, but the actual, <laughs> the actual evidence, the actual evidence on that suggests that if you get about 1.6 grams uh, of protein per kilogram body weight per day, you can maximize uh, resistance training outcomes, including muscle mass and strength. Um, and that's Ir- that's irrespective of the actual dietary protein, like where it comes from, whether it being from plant sources, whether it being from animal derived sources, et cetera. So the take home point for the clinician is to increase dietary protein intake. And this can be from just whole food uh, sources. So just more uh, protein or um, there's some recommendation, uh, weak recommendations out there for in, uh, a dietary protein supplement. Um, the reason why or that may be advantageous if somebody is, you know, averse to eating more dietary protein, you know, otherwise, but a shake would be uh, something more palatable or uh, more easy for them to adhere to. Um, and in that case, really, you're looking for any type of good uh, either whey protein isolate for somebody who's uh, okay with taking that or a, uh, a high uh, essential amount amino acid content in a uh, plant-based protein. So pea protein isolate, soy protein isolate, that those would work. That being said, the, the evidence overall on dietary protein supplements is fairly weak in the context of high dietary protein intake, period. If you have somebody who's taking, who's eating low amounts of dietary protein, then you can make a stronger case for these sort of essential amino acid rich foods. So for example, if you have an older patient with chronic kidney disease, and, you know, the recommendation they get from their nephrologist is to decrease their dietary protein intake, you would probably make a stronger case for eating uh, uh, protein sources that have a lot of essential amino acids. So that may include a supplement or they might actually supplement with essential amino acids. This has actually been studied in a handful of randomized controlled trials. Um, to be fair, this isn't the best quality evidence, but there has been um, randomized controlled trials in patients with sarcopenia suggesting that essential amino acid content or supplementation in addition to resistance training can actually improve outcomes in these patients and and actually fairly uh, long-term follow-up periods, like four years, I think, in one of them uh, and one year in another. So overall, increasing dietary protein intake seems to be a reasonable recommendation. Do you need to supplement? It depends on the patient. Um, And if you're going to supplement, I think just making sure there's a a substantial amount of essential amino acids and uh, they have uh, on the actual supplement itself you would want a an appro- uh, a stamp from the uh, Certificate of Good Manufacturing Processes, so CGMP. That basically means that, hey, what's on the label is in the thing and nothing else. So contamination is low concern there. And then um, if you happen to have a master's level athlete or other, uh, you know, athletic person who might be drug testing, <laughs> just theoretically, um, you would want an additional uh, certification from like the NSF, 
or informed sport, which basically means that nothing that would make them test positive on a drug test uh, is in that thing. And so, because honestly, if we're as as uh, clinicians, if we're recommending people take supplements, the last thing we'd want to do is recommend them to take something that's tainted or contaminated or might actually harm their health. Uh, and then just, sorry, I know I'm just going on here, but the the last thing I just want to drive home because people will say, well, isn't high protein intake associated with bad, like general badness, bad health outcomes? Like I, I heard that somewhere. I read that somewhere. But actually, with respect to dietary protein intake, we have um, long-term data. This is up to a year where people were actually eating 4.4 grams per kilogram body weight of protein per day. Uh, so a lot. So if you had a hundred kilo person, they're eating 440 grams of dietary protein per day, whereas Ooh. the RDA is only is uh, you know uh, about 70 grams of protein per day. So they're eating a I lot. Can't imagine and, uh, the GI distress from that. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, there, yes, 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 yes. But uh, so so the ta- the take home is if you can you know increase somebody's dietary protein intake, and if you want numbers, it's uh, 1.2 to 2.0 grams per kilo per day. Um, and that's uh, corroborated by other additional evidence uh, and international working groups as, as well. So that'd be the recommendation. Austin, I when I used to, you know, when I was in college and I, I thought I might be able to get big one day, which was not the case, and I was lifting <laughs> weights, I remember trying to track this uh, dietary protein thing. And I, I mean, if, if, if you have a 100 kilogram patient, 100 grams of protein to get that from Whole Foods, that's, you, you got to eat a lot of food, right? You Or certainly a lot of meat and like yeah it's gonna, it's it's going to depend on the it's de- going to depend on the overall dietary pattern that the person yeah. prefers so you know they might be able to get it from dairy sources might be a preference to some individuals uh meats if somebody prefers that although you know the the choice of meat there could be better or worse choices on that front sure. if somebody chooses to get 100 grams of protein from uh you know highly processed meats might not be the the best idea yeah. I don't know, it's um, fine. Then, I'm not sure if you're still recommendations, but we can get the process. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's yeah. really exciting time for cattle farmers, yeah. so congrats. Yeah. Sorry, and, carry uh, on. And, for free. And, and plant-based sources, you know, they, they contain it as well. And there's trace proteins that come from a lot of other foods that are kind of incorporated into the diet that people might not otherwise suspect. But I think giving people just kind of a rough target, um, again, to make it somewhat practical, um, it may require them to consume, you know, uh, maybe something a little bit more frequently. Uh, but again, I think that we're we're dealing with risks and benefits and trade offs with all the different things that we that we're recommending for or against, and uh, this is kind of where the evidence uh, is pointing us right now. Yeah, the uh, the for patient uh, like communication, you can you can tell them, hey, if you have a palm sized portion of protein at every meal, ideally you're having you know three to four uh, or up to five meals per day, um, that'll give you about four to five ounces of protein. And each one of those is going to be about 25 to, to 35 grams of protein. And so doing that over and over and over again, you'll, you'll get to this recommendation quite readily. Um, and, and again, if someone has a low protein intake though, uh, by based on their another medical condition, then you might have to get a little fancier with your, your recommendation, but yeah. yep, palm, palm size protein servings can be, can be, uh, easily understood by most people. One last thing I wanted to ask, I I guess, before we get to take home points, because this is, um, is for patients with sarcopenia, what kind of results can we tell them to expect if they are following the protein recommendations, if they are doing the resistance training and, you know, if we're able to kind of progressively load them and and build up, what sort of results might they expect? Uh, Austin and then Jordan, you can yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is a this is a pretty big topic, but I'll condense it down quite a bit. So we have uh, there, there, the exercise science world. Uh, there's lots and lots and lots of data from training people across, uh, you know, sexes, across ages. And what we see consistently uh, across everything is this enormous inter-individual variability in terms of responsiveness to training, meaning that some people, you know, if you put a uh, hundred people on a given training program, you might see some people not do so well. Some people might do remarkably well, and most people fall somewhere in between, for example. Um, there's a great paper from 2016 or 2017 by uh, Atianen and their colleagues on this that we can we can send you guys because they have some good graphs on this. And it basically shows across the aging spectrum and men and women, they have the same kind of general distribution of training responses. And so it's really hard to tell somebody a specific recommendation, you can expect to lift this much weight or something like that. Rather, what I tend to do is tend to set physical function goals for an individual, something that they can aim to work towards. And then once we get by the time they get there, we can set a new kind of physical function goal, or they might be happy to kind of try to maintain their function at that point. But what I would say is that for the people on the lower end of the spectrum who might go through this process and not get that great of a response, 
typically that reflects a situation where they have a higher degree of this anabolic resistance phenomenon, where they have been more resistant to the intervention that we have provided them. And typically that would reflect kind of a generally maybe a worse underlying disease state. Maybe they're further down the spectrum, more severe. Uh, the closer you get to cachexia, the more refractory you get to these kind of interventions. And so really the best hope you have, if you can get them to buy into it, is to increase the intensity of the intervention, increase the dose. You remember Jordan said earlier about the dose dependent relationship between exercise volume, uh, uh, and training outcomes. So maybe getting them to exercise more is the best you can hope to do. But again, that's kind of what can be a hard sell for some people, maybe who have, you know, cancer related cachexia or something like that. Uh, but again, more physical activity is, is typically better than less for this patient population. And again, maybe in that situation, their goals might be relatively modest. Maybe they're not trying to go and lift a whole bunch of weight, but they want to be able to ambulate independently, get in and out of bed, get on and off the toilet. Whereas before they might not, not have been able to get out of a chair without assistance. And so setting those kind of mod modest physical activity or, or or, uh, physical function goals might are probably perfectly realistic for just about everybody to be able to accomplish with the right dose of uh, intervention. Yep. Uh, uh, with respect to actual evidence on the uh, on these interventions within um, the sarcopenic population, there's a handful of randomized controlled trials, and I'll just say this off the bat: I don't love these studies because the training is underdosed. Uh, so what they were doing is actually having patients exercise with resistance bands and ankle weights, yeah. uh, very, very light ankle weights, and then they were giving them essential amino acids. So I, I mentioned that earlier, uh, that that would be like the what you would be looking for in a high-quality protein supplement, the amount of um, essential amino acids. And they were underdosing both the resistance training and the protein. But nevertheless, uh, within a year, uh, or sorry, the, this one particular study, which was uh, the first follow-up was at three months, they gained 3% muscle mass, 9% muscle strength and decrease or uh, increase their gait speed to be normal uh, based on the the gait speed test that we use to uh, we can use to diagnose uh, sarcopenia so despite the underdosing of these things and their heterogeneity of uh, training uh, or resistance training uh, induced adaptations we seem to see a benefit there um, but I, I would agree with dr. Baraki that um, you know if you're having a person who's not getting a good response from their their training the uh, the best practice is usually to increase the dose. Um, and that doesn't apply to all medicine, but it, <laughs> if, uh, if resistance training were a medicine, that's, that's typically the, the recommendation we have there. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, hopefully that quality of life function will improve less falls. Uh, and then I don't, I don't know if there's evidence for mortality, but that's, you know, those would all be kind of like the, I think what these people would be interested in, what the clinicians would be interested in. There is yep. data for that as well. We're happy to provide it to you. <laughs> okay, good. Good stuff. All right. So I think um, this is super interesting. I'm, I'm sure we could talk for hours, but we, we do have to get take-home points. Jordan, we'll start with you. We'll go reverse alphabetical order this time. Jordan, we'll start with you. And then Austin, you can have final word on your take-home points. Sure. Uh, ideal goals um, for clinicians who are seeing uh, patients would be to, one, identify those who are either at risk or who have sarcopenia. So you can use the old clinical eye uh, or some of the objective tests that we, we mentioned here. Um, then second point would be to attempt to get the patient motivated to engage in exercise, ideally meeting the minimum activity guide uh, recommendations from the 2018 physical activity guidelines for adults. Uh, should definitely be familiar with that so we can increase that rate of uh, physician knowledge from 10 percent to uh, hope, hopefully uh, hopefully uh, at least 20 percent you know let's try to get a try try to get a nice qi pro project here yeah. shoot and for the then, moon and mess so among the stars. <laughs> yeah that's right that's right and then um, also just gen the general recommendation to increase dietary protein again the the uh, hard numbers would be between 1.2 and 2.0 grams per kilo uh, body weight um, and again you can communicate that via uh, palm size portions if that's the easiest way for you to communicate uh, your patient. Yeah, I agree with those. And the one that I would add has to do with kind of, again, the practical approach to, to making this happen. Uh, really, it's about kind of crafting a, a narrative around exercise and physical activity that both makes sense to the patient and that uh, is, is, is meaningful to them. So, so what I mean when I say that it makes sense to the patient means you don't tell the patient at, on one hand, you have a bunch of wear and tear in your knee. And then in the next sentence, you tell them, and I want you to increase your physical activity because those seem like conflicting recommendations to the patient. And so you're building uh, a narrative that's not going to work 
to in the patient's mind. So we need to build a, a narrative that doing this physical activity is safe, that there is a starting dose of activity that you can engage in, and that we'd like to progress it from there. And it should be progressed towards meaningful goals and towards meaningful uh, activities that the patient would like to be able to accomplish and, and, and perform. I think tying it to, uh, to something that's meaningful to the individual is the best way that you're going to have to be able to get them to actually buy into something like this. Last thing, you want to give a plug, uh, your your Instagram, your Twitter, your website, podcast. Where can people find you guys? Sure. Uh, so very active on Instagram, YouTube, and other social media outlets. Uh, if you search Barbell Medicine, you'll find all of our stuff. Me in particular, uh, my Instagram handle is Jordan underscore Barbell Medicine. YouTube channel is Barbell Medicine. Our podcast is the Barbell Medicine Podcast that's available across all these different platforms, which you guys are familiar with if you're listening to this great podcast, which is on my automatic download list. Love oh, the thank you so much. Stuff. I feel so honored to be here. And then uh, <laughs> we are getting into the Twitter game. Uh, so you can follow us on Twitter and uh, check out some of the uh, uh, tutorials that we have planned uh, to come out. Oh, excellent. Yep. Yeah, I agree with those. My Twitter handle is Austin Baraki. I just mainly retweet interesting stuff that I find. And uh, yeah, I guess I'm getting roped into writing some tutorials about this stuff. So uh, I'll, those will be coming out soon. Yeah. Okay, guys, this was fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, Thank thanks you. a lot. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. I'm hungry. Gross. <laughs> Get show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. That's right, Paul, because we're committed to providing you with high value practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes or contact us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. Special thanks to our producers for the show. Just one producer, Dr. Cyrus Askin, and to our social media team, Hannah R. Abrams on Twitter, Beth Garbs Garbatelli on Instagram, and Chris the Chew Man Chew on Facebook. Until next time. But I've wait, been... who does our music? I believe Stuart it's Stuart. Hen- <laughs> Great. Good stuff. <laughs> Sorry, who are you again? Stuart Kent Brigham. Yes, thank you, Kent. Stuart, for our wonderful theme music, which is most surely playing uh, bo- beneath my voice right now. Uh, <laughs> Until next time, I've been Matthew Frank Watto. And I remain Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. Thank you and goodbye. Is there a pun? I don't have enough strength to put out a pun tonight. <laughs> that was that was C weak. minus. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. Oh. Did you hear the dog? I didn't. Oh. <laughs> Is that a She's sound bark. bite? No. Oh, that's, that's your actual dog. Okay. That's, that's my actual right, dog. I'm gonna stop recording.